Good evening to everyone. Welcome to Gene Explain webinar. Our topic of today is transcription factors and their classification. And I am very happy to present um, uh, to present you presenter of today, Professor Edgar Wingender, who is um, uh, Chief Executive Officer of our company Gene Explain GmbH. And uh, Professor Edgar Wingender is also retired director of the Institute of Bioinformatics of University Medical Center, Göttingen. Um, name of Professor Wingender is very well known to many researchers around the world uh, as a principal founder of Transfact database. You know, Transfact database is about transcription factors and their properties and their binding sites and binding profiles. With this, I will stop now and uh, Professor Wingender, you are very welcome to take over and we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Olga. I'm now going to share my screen with you. Okay, here we are. So welcome everybody to our today's seminar, which is, as Olga already said, about transcription factors and their classification. Transcription factors, obviously that has something to do with transcription and I will show you a few principles that uh, are necessary just to remind and remember to uh, uh, understand what we are talking about when dealing with factors and their classification. And bear with me, uh, when I include also some historic reminiscences here and there um, and uh, ju just it's due to my age probably. Transcription. The transcription process looks like that. Just to remind you, it is the rewriting in the more or less same alphabet uh, as the sequence of the uh, template DNA uh, suggests and uh, uh, the three prime, five prime direction of a DNA template is read by an enzyme called RNA polymerase and this polymerase synthesizes now an RNA strand that looks like that. Transcription is rewriting, literally translated, whereas translation is something else. That's translation into another language using other symbols, other words. No, don't mix up. Occasionally it uh, it happens. Transcription. Transcription uh, is a very important process, especially it is one of the most regulated uh, and most sophisticated regulated process in the whole uh, workflow of gene expression. Transcription regulation plays a role in practically any biological process that you can think of, whether it is just um, controlling the expression of housekeeping genes in each and every uh, tissue that we have in a multicellular differentiated body, whether it is about the developmental control of different types of cells and organs, their differentiation, finally to come up with uh, tissue specific gene expression programs uh, or to uh, regulate the cell cycle for further division of the cells apoptosis, hormonal regulation, circadian rhythm, detoxification, metabolic regulation, each and every of these biological processes is subject to tight transcriptional regulation. Why it is important to deal with transcription and to do transcriptional research? Well, it may be obvious that each and everything that uh, is important in biology is worth to study. I just would like to point out a few points since uh, there are quite different approaches to um, apply when we deal with these different topics. Of course, principally we want to understand how gene specificity of transcriptional regulation is achieved at all. And with that, we will immediately enter the field of transcription factors. What is interesting and uh, got momentum these uh, years is to develop gene, genome-wide maps of regulatory sequence signals 
um, docking sites for individual transcription factors in the genome and to map transcription regulatory regions, promoters, enhancers, and so on to come up with a complete atlas of the regulatory features of a whole genome. We would like to make use of that knowledge to recognize such regulatory sequence signals in the genome and maybe to uh, understand the very complex structure of these regions that is uh, not at all trivial and still to a large extent an unsolved issue today. We would like to be able to predict the DNA binding specificity of newly discovered transcription factors to construct system-wide transcription networks in order to understand also the transcription dysregulation in case that a certain disease phenotype is developing and to render transcription regulation amenable for targeted alteration when we speak about genetic therapies. We can uh, classify these different tasks into purely biological ones, the gray ones, into tasks that are classically assigned to bioinformatic research, to uh, systems biology or maybe to more modern synthetic biology when it is about the more engineering aspects at the very end of the scale. But for all of that, we need to understand what are the regulators of the process we are dealing with, with transcription. So I mentioned already transcription is achieved by an enzyme that we call RNA polymerase because it synthesizes RNA. It does it in a DNA dependent way Therefore, it is a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And the complex of this polymerase, which consists of many subunits from yeast, um, is looking like that. It is taken from a certain entry in the PDB uh, database. In E. coli, we, have, we know about one RNA polymerase with uh, four subunits. In eukaryotes, the picture is way more complex. We have at least three polymerases uh, that uh, we know in, in mammalian cells, for instance, and most other eukaryotes. There may be a fourth one in plants. Uh, for now, let's forget about number four. The first three are uh, specialized to certain types of genes. Polymerase one, or also called polymerase A, is specific for only one gene recognizing one promoter, which is the big one for uh, the large RNA, ribosomal RNAs. Polymerase two or B synthesizes messenger RNA in principle. And then there is a third one that was discovered a little bit later and called polymerase C, actually not just because it is in this line of A and B, but it was detected first in cytoplasmic extracts of the cells. And therefore, the C originally stood for cytoplasmic RNA polymerase. But of course, it is mainly active in the nucleus as the others are, and is mainly responsible for the transcription of tRNA, ribosomal 5S RNA, and a few others. So most important we will deal with is RNA polymerase B that has 12 subunits. It's in itself already a quite complex uh, issue. And when we take serious what uh, Monod has told us already from the bacterial cells, polymerase may detect promoters, bind to them, and then transcribe the gene. That's it. And the problem, all problems with uh, regard to transcription are solved. Unfortunately, it is not that easy. Take an in vitro system, in, vi in vitro assay, take a well-defined gene with a strong promoter and put their RNA polymerase on it. You will get, when you put it in the, to do it in the presence of some radionucleotides and uh, uh, put afterwards the products on a, on a gel, then you will get a smear like this that you have here in lane D. You have all kinds of fragments initiating at any nucleotide of your gene and um, uh, terminating anywhere. So there is no specific uh, event going on when you take pure polymerase. When you do the same experiments, uh, the same experiment with a whole cellular extract, then you get a very specific band of the product in the correct size. So the polymerase in that case initiates correctly at the promoter side 
Obviously, the whole cell contains additional components that direct the polymerase to the right side in front of the gene. So what people then did in the early 80s, and this is from 1980, what I show you here, is to take this extract, fractionate them with conventional biochemical methods, with certain chromatographic methods, for instance, and you uh, come up with, in this case, four different fractions. And now you combine these fractions and you see when you combine fractions A, C, and D, then you can restore nicely this specific transcriptional activity. Fine. So now it is, uh, it, it looked quite easy. Now let's go into these fractions A, C, and D and purify further and further the um, polymerase specificity directing activities. This is what, what people have done. And first of all, we get fractions A, B, C, and D. And now, yeah, well, the different activities that were uh, detected in, in these fractions were called correspondingly, when they did it with the polymerase three system, TF3A, fraction A, TF3B, and TF3C. Similar for the Paul II system, we get TF2A, TF2B, TF2D. For whatever reason, I'm not going into the details, TF2B was here assigned to fraction C. Don't be confused, but you get an idea where these interesting, uh, this interesting nomenclature comes from. There is no TF2C that was in the beginning there and turned out later to be something unspecific, so there was not a, uh, that was not a transcription factor. So now we have a collection of these TF2 something, two for polymerase two, which we today call general transcription factors. Are these all DNA binding factors? One of them is the standard promoter of a eukaryotic cell has a Tata box about 30 positions in front of the transcription start site, the TSS. The Tata box is recognized and bound by TBP, the Tata box binding protein. But it's not alone. It associates with a number of TBP associating factors, so-called TAFs, and there is quite a number of them. And all of them together with TBP form the transcription factor TF2D. But that's not all. We have already seen we know, need a bit more than just this fraction D. We need, for instance, the general transcription factor TF2A, which is a heterotrimeric complex in itself. More lucky we were with TF2B, which is just a monomeric. And as you can guess from this sketch, both TF2A and TF2B are in contact with the DNA and even have a slight sequence specificity. Um, as TBP has. Interestingly, some promoters don't have a Tata box, but even those promoters depend on a compl complete TF2D factor, including the TBP. It has to be there, even if there is no Tata box, it will be included in the whole pre-initiation complex through protein-protein interaction with all the other components of this complex. It's still not all, now the polymerase two associates to the pre-initiation complex together with an elongation factor TF2E, which is a heterotetramer. Then comes TF2F, a heterodimer. Then TF2H associates, which is a quite complex uh, uh, structure in itself, having uh, two subcomplexes of core and the protein kinase COM2 can start the synthesis of RNA from the TSS on. Altogether, we have a complex of about 45 individual polypeptides assembled in this pre-initiation transcription complex. The efficiency with which this uh, pre-initiation complex assembles around this core promoter, Tata box to uh, transcription start site, is controlled by a number of additional proteins that bind to upstream sequence elements. At that time, they were called upstream factors. 
And this is what we call today mostly transcription factors. These are proteins that bind in a relaxed DNA binding specificity way uh, to a specific way to individual sequence elements in the promoter and in the enhancer form direct contacts to the components of the pre-initiation complex. Nearly any of these components can be targeted by them uh, directly or by so-called activators uh, or co-activators uh, uh, or adapter proteins. This is what we occasionally can call an enhancer-some. So in addition to the assembly of general transcription factors, a number of upstream factors is required and the number and the kind of these upstream factors depends very much on the individual gene. And all this, uh, these enhancer-some factors are required to give the chromatin a favorable structure for further transcription for the polymerase to walk through. Uh, for instance, by initiating proper modifications, say acetylation of the histones and the nucleosomes that are attached to this uh, gene um, region in the genome. Time for a definition. What is a transcription factor? And when you go to all kinds of resources, to introductions of papers, to Wikipedia or whatever, you find quite a number of different uh, definitions. And when you think about individual proteins that are involved in the regulation of transcription, you always find an exception. I once tried in a paper in uh, 1997 to come up with this kind of uh, definition. A transcription factor is a protein that regulates transcription, fine, by specific interaction with DNA, fine, or after nuclear translocation by stoichiometric interaction with a protein that can be assembled into a sequence specific DNA protein complex. So forget about the details. It's not that important. For today, it is enough to uh, consider that not all but most transcription factors we are addressing today are uh, in fact binding directly to DNA. A simplified and typical structure of such a transcription factor uh, may contain, comprise the following domains. First of all, most of them have a DNA binding domain or a DBD. This is kind of primary function of the whole protein to recognize a cis-regulatory element to bind to and then exert its activity. And then, of course, it has to have a domain that really provides this function, contacts and interacts with components of the pre-initiation complex, uh, raising the efficiency of their assembly. And this is what we call the transactivation domain that provides the ultimate function of the transcription factor, usually the activation of a transcription. Occasionally, this may be a transrepression domain that is also possible. Usually, these transactivation domains look quite boring. These are so-called low-complexity regions, just um, oligomeric stretches of polyproline, polyserine, uh, or acidic residues. In the case of transrepression domain, there are frequently polyalanine residues that to be found there. And that's it. But they are extremely important, obviously. There are two other domains in that sketch. One is the dimerization domain. Many, if not most, of the transcription factors form dimers, homo or heterodimers. And the kind of these dimers is uh, sometimes very um, uh, importantly regulating the DNA binding specificity. Therefore, it is very closely linked to the DNA binding domain in this sketch because it uh, is, um, uh, has an in impact on the DNA binding as well. And this red box here stands for the regulatory domain. Sometimes the transcription factor needs a uh, post-translation modification, say a phosphorylation to become active or to become uh, inactive again. Or sometimes the regulatory domain provides interaction with um, uh, low, molecular, uh, uh, low molecular weight molecule like a steroid, and we speak about nuclear receptors. 
uh, and then only then it can become active as a transcription factor. So many of the transcription factors have such a regulatory domain as well. And in fact, there may be other domains that provide then protein-protein interaction with other components of the enhancerosome, uh, which we will not target further today. Now, as you have seen from the title of this webinar, we uh, will try to classify transcription factors. Why is it necessary to bother with something like that uh, to classify transcription factors? And since most of them have a DNA binding domain, I did it on the basis of the features of these DVD. I thought it might be interesting to have such a classification. First, to pri provide a systematic view uh, of the subject, of the subject of transcription factors. Why so? Well, I would like to cite Conrad Lorenz, the famous zoologist and behavioral scientist who said, knowledge without order is like household equipment on a, on a cart. This is something I found very interesting, inspiring. So I tried to bring some order in this zoo of DNA binding domain containing proteins many years ago. But it was uh, done with a certain idea in, in, the, in my thoughts because um, I would wanted to uh, make an attempt to address the problem of uh, the DNA recognition code for such protein domains, whether there is such a recognition code at all and how it may it look like. What kind of amino acid side chains in such a DNA binding domain are responsible to recognize what kind of nucleotide features in the, in the target sequence? Well, of course, I was not the only one that came up with such a brilliant idea. There were uh, already excellent work done by Suzuki and Yagi, for instance, in the 90s, who uh, came up with a complete catalog uh, for uh, helix turn helix for uh, uh, certain other domains, the zinc finger domains of nuclear receptors and others, and found out that there is something like a protein DNA recognition code that certain amino acid side chains at a certain position in the DVD are responsible to recognize certain nucleotides in the binding site. But from that, we also learned very early that the protein DNA recognition code is class specific. So for each and every type of transcription factor DNA binding domain, there is an own recognition code that we have to decipher. In other words, we need a transcription factor classification based on DNA binding domains. Another aim was to find functional correlates of the transcription factors that we know and have experimental evidence for what they are doing. This is a very interesting point and it leads us even to the evolution of DNA binding domains in transcription factors. And I will address that point at the end of my talk today. I will not address today how we can make use of that knowledge to predict DNA binding specificities for new transcription factors, because that has already been addressed many years ago in this uh, paper by Alexander Kell, Philipp Stegmaier, and Denitza Alamanova, uh, where they did some uh, uh, homology modeling for DNA binding domains and predicted the uh, uh, DNA binding motifs of the transcription factors. Many years ago, it was already in 1997, uh, it, I came up with the suggestion how to do a transcription factor classification scheme. Um, I noticed, first of all, that there are at least two structural levels of DNA binding domains that can be used to identify classes. And this is what you usually find in the literature. Uh, these classes like nuclear receptor types, zinc fingers and so on. But some of these classes have some features in common. So I grouped them into super classes that reflect the general topology of the DNA binding domains. For instance, something like zinc coordinating DNA binding domains. We will see examples for all of them later on. 
And then there are two other levels that are more addressing sequence similarities. Uh, and uh, first of all, I call this level the family uh, because they have very, very similar uh, DNA binding domain sequences, like all the thyroid hormone receptor related factors. Uh, they have very similar, not, uh, although not identical DNA binding domains by the sequence comparison. And sometimes there is a more elaborate structure in the sequence hierarchy. So I uh, uh, created this uh, subfamily level, which in most cases, or many cases is just an optional. Sometimes it did not make sense to assign a subfamily level. So far you can see we have four levels and these four levels can be used to come up with a four digit number that characterizes a certain group of DNA binding domains, which is very similar to the four digit numbers that you are familiar with in the enzyme nomenclature. Uh, there's also this kind of four digit classification numbers. But all these four levels, superclasses to subfamilies, are more abstract entities. They are constructs by our uh, knowledge and our intellect. But then there are two more levels that refer to physical entities. I call them genus and species or factor or molecular species. Genus refers to a transcription factor gene. That is what you can use to re-identify the transcription factor in Uniprot, for instance, which is mainly a gene-centric. Uh, database according to its uh, organization. And at the end, we have the uh, factor species. These are the individual transcription factor polypeptides where you can assign really a protein sequence to. Uh, so in other words, these are the splice variants that are encoded by one transcription factor gene. This is the complete list of superclasses that uh, we were able to identify so far. I will go into the details right now uh, and start first with the basic domains, which may look like that. This is one uh, molecular model from uh, this PDB entry for the transcription factor CREP, cyclic IMP response element binding protein. And their particular feature is that they have a certain stretch of basic residues, which is this one here, that contacts the DNA. The main feature is they have lots of positive charges, positively charged amino acid side chains that interact with negative charges of the phosphate backbone of the uh, DNA strands. This helical part is then smoothly squeezed into the major groove of the DNA. And they always uh, dimerize, homo or heterodimerize. You see there's another molecule like that also uh, put into the major groove on the other side of the DNA double helix. And their heterodimer or homodimerization is done through this part of the molecule, which is a so-called leucine zipper. This part actually is always helically structured. It has uh, leucine residue at every seventh position, which means in every, at every second round of the uh, alpha helical part, and they are interdigitating from the one and the other molecule, forming a hydrophobic uh, interface between these two uh, molecule, molecules. This part, which has a cluster of positive charges, is unstructured when the, as long as the whole dimer is free in solution because there's a repulsion between these positive charges that uh, do not allow for a helical structure here. They become helically uh, structured extensions of the, uh, of the leucine zipper only after these positive charges are neutralized by the negative charges of the backbone of the DNA. The next and actually largest superclass uh, of the uh, eukaryotic transcription factors are the so-called zinc coordinating DNA binding domains. You all have heard about the so-called zinc fingers that form modules in these uh, proteins. And this is as an example, uh, a heterodimer of two nuclear receptor molecules. I think it's the glucocorticoid receptor. And here these little red dots, these are 
zinc ions. And they help to get, uh, to help, help to get together the whole structure. And there are always two zinc fingers in each of these molecules, zinc, zinc ion here. And one of these helical structures exerts the helix into the major groove in quite the same way as we have seen it for the leucine zipper proteins. Uh, and the other zinc finger structure is perpendicularly orient oriented to this one and help to stabilize the whole structure. Actually, these zinc finger structures were discovered first in the pol 3 transcription factor, TF3A. And it was one of the uh, most favored pets in the early transcription factor research because there is a resource, Xenobus oocytes, where I think 15% of the whole protein in these fertilized eggs is this one transcription factor. Why so? The zinc fingers do not just bind to DNA, into a promoter, they can also bind RNA. And TF3A also serves as a storage protein for the product of the gene for the 5S ribosomal RNA. It has to be stored because at a certain point of all site development, RNA polymerase, one comes up and then provides the uh, precursor for all the other ribosomal RNAs. But POL3 is a bit slower and has to have some, some uh, time ahead of the POL1 activity so uh, that enough 5S ribosomal RNA is available at the right time. So it has to be stored and TS3A is the storage protein. When people came up with the sequence, they uh, quickly recognized, and that was early work, mainly of Aaron Kluck, the Nobel laureate, that there is a repetitive structure of nine consecutive cis, cysteine, cysteine, histidine, histidine repeats. And he suggested at that time, there was no experimental proof yet, that they may, have, may form structures like that, coordinating zinc ions, coordinated in a tetrahedrical way by two cis and two his residues. And nine of these zinc fingers then form an array uh, of the whole DNA binding domain. So that was the first uh, eukaryotic or better say human transcription factor we knew the sequence of. And shortly after uh, then people re uh, found that the nuclear receptors like the glucocorticoid receptor also have such a zinc finger like structure but not comprising to C to H but to, uh, to cysteine here and to cysteine residues there. So it is, um, in that case, four cysteine residues that coordinate one zinc ion. So now we had two types of zinc finger proteins, one of TS3A type, the other of a nuclear receptor type that was now in 1985. And the idea was maybe all transcription factors of higher eukaryotes have such a zinc finger structure. We know or knew already at that time that prokaryotic transcription factors usually have a helix turn helix structure, which is quite different from what we see here. At least no zinc finger structures were known from prokaryotes. So maybe eukaryotes work in a completely different way than prokaryotes do. Well, as you may guess, it was not that simple because the next superclass here are actually eukaryotic and human helix turn helix domains. And there is a lot of them. Again, as in the two other su uh, superclasses, they have a, have a DNA recognition helix that it inserts into the major groove and two other helices are uh, at the back of this uh, uh, and uh, stabilize the whole structure. And actually, it was then shortly after all the zinc finger structures were discovered, three years later in 1988, that uh, the Antennapedia homeodomain in Drosophila has a helix turn helix motif in the DNA binding domain. And then homologues were found later on in all the higher eukaryotes in the mammals, where we have lots of these homeotic proteins 
<coughs> that all have such a homeo domain with a helix to an helix DNA binding motif. And lots of others that we do not classify as homeoproteins have the same DNA binding motif with slight structural differences and additions as well. Then there are a few more that are much uh, less populated, some other superclasses, like those that comprise an assemble of uh, alpha helix helical elements only, especially HMG proteins belong to that. They form uh, such an L-like structure with two helices here, one helix there, uh, but they do not squeeze into the major groove, rather they squeeze into the minor groove. Different to all the other proteins that we have uh, seen so far, they actually bind to the DNA through the minor groove, which is much less susceptible for an alpha helix geometry, but they squeeze in in such a way that they widen the minor groove in such a way that the whole DNA double helix axis gets bent by 90 degree. So it induces a sharp kink in the DNA. The completely different principle of uh, binding to the DNA than we have seen so far. Well, we have uh, then the next case, the alpha helices that are exposed by beta structures. It looks like that. It's not just a uh, helix that is again squeezed into the major groove. Here the alpha helices line up along the backbone of the DNA in parallel to the, nearly in parallel to the double helix axis like this. And the structure is stabilized by a, a beta uh, uh, structure on the back. A very important uh, uh, superclass are the so-called immunoglobulin folds. NF-kappa-B and P53 belong to this superclass. They have a butterfly-like structure and as delicate as a butterfly, they just touch gently the DNA with a few loops like that one. Uh, they do it in the major as well as in the minor groove. They may also touch the backbone here and there. And by this, they actually exert a very nice DNA mining specificity. We have the hairpins exposed, the beta hairpins exposed by an alpha helical structure. Here we have a beta hairpin by two beta sheets as, uh, as that, and they are inserted into the major groove. So not an alpha helix in the major groove, but the beta sheet in this case, or beta hairpin actually. Then we have beta sheets to bind to the DNA. It looks like that, which is a much more complex structure where uh, really a beta sheet is squeezed into the minor groove as we had it for the alpha helices in the HMG proteins. Here, the beta sheet is inserted there. And TBP, our old friend we uh, learned already about, Tata binding protein, is, uh, has that structure. It is squeezed into the minor groove and also induces a sharp kink in the helix axis of the DNA. The last one is much less characterized, the beta barrel DNA binding domains. We just have a protein uh, structure for that. To my knowledge, there is no co-crystal with the DNA yet, but it has been biochemically shown that this structure binds to the DNA in a sequence specific manner. And at the end, sorry, I have to go back. We have there another superclass, which I just called superclass zero, because I put in, in this basket, everything that is not yet characterized, but has a DNA binding characteristics and DNA binding domain, which is structurally and sometimes even by sequence assignment, not yet uh, characterized. Well, these different superclasses are of quite different cardinality. As you can see from this graph, and I have here the superclass distribution of the genera, that means of the transcription factor encoding genes in the human genome, more than half of all TF genes encode zinc finger proteins. Another quarter of them 
encodes the helix to an helix uh, domain proteins like the homeo domain proteins. And this blue segment here are the basic domains like BZIP, BHLH, and so on. And these are the smaller uh, other factor uh, superclasses. These 4% are the immunoglobulin fold and so on. Uh, so the uh, three larger superclasses uh, comprise about 90% of all human transcription factors. When we have a look at the distribution of the human molecular species, the proteins, then we see, uh, well, a similar distribution. However, less than half are zinc finger proteins, about one quarter again, are the helix to helix domains. That's uh, simply due to the fact that uh, we have much less splicing variants for the zinc finger proteins than for others. I will come to that a bit later again. This again shows you that uh, the splice variability is quite different in say the zinc finger and the homeo domain proteins and uh, uh, in the immunoglobulin fold and the alpha helices exposed by beta structures, we have much more uh, splice variants than in other superclasses. That's the family structure of the first superclass here we have uh, uh, three classes, the leucine zipper factors, the helix loop helix factors, BHLH, uh, or the helix span helix factors, uh, BHSH. There is actually only one example for that. Actually, some of these BHLH and the helix loop helix part here is a protein protein interaction interface, have in addition also a leucine zipper, but we uh, due to the similarity of the DNA binding, we classified them as a one family in this uh, BHLH class. How did we come up with families and family structures? That was done by an extensive phylogenetic analysis. We made hundreds of phylogenetic analyses and trees for each of these superclasses, classes, the families to identify subfamilies and so on and so on. The, uh, interclass interaction behavior was also considered and the DNA binding specificity. And now we come up with these families for the leucine zippers, for instance, we have here the Jun related, the FOS related factors and some others. The uh, MAF related XPP1 ATF4, a big family are the CREP related factors and so on and so on. CEBP, another important factor. But it is not only uh, this, this list of transcription factors, uh, there are also, we also generated logo plots for all groups of these DNA binding domains. This is the one for the uh, BZIP factors in general, and there are logo plots then for the individual families and subfamilies. And you can get the whole alignments, all the sequences, in a fast A format, that's all available. You can get it from the resources that I will uh, show you later and the, give you the URLs later. When we have a closer look at uh, the first subfamily, the Jun factors, there are three genera in there, C Jun, Jun B, Jun D. And when you have a closer look at their DNA binding domains, then you see here, with all these positive signs, that's the basic domain, the DNA binding domain, and here is the leucine zipper with a leucine residue at every seventh position of the dimerization interface. And I have here uh, compared the logo plot for the mammalian and the whole vertebrate uh, group, vertebrates without the mammal uh, components. And in that case, you can easily identify some discriminating position where you can see here, for instance, is one position where we have a leucine for the Jun B and isoleucine in C Jun and Jun D. Here is another discriminating position where we have glutamine here, uh, but an uh, acidic residue for Jun B and so on and so on. So sometimes you can boil down the differences between the DNA binding domains in one family or subfamily to few discriminating positions. So if you get a new uh, factor that might belong to that, just have a look at these few positions and you can 
classified already. We have also included uh, some, some logo plots for the DNA binding uh, preferences of these factors. Uh, they come all from one certain uh, source. Uh, that uh, was a paper of the group of UC Taipale at Karolinska Institute. We had a joint project with them. And then in this project, we included these uh, logo plots. However, uh, it is just for information, these motifs, these uh, um, uh, patterns are not so well suited to make predictions, but this is another story. And there are cross links to other databases. First of all, of course, here you see accession numbers of uh, the Transfac database uh, where you can navigate to. Uh, there are cross links to Uniprot, the use here. PDB are those uh, cross links here. And we also have cross links to the human protein atlas where you can clearly see where in which tissues, in which cells this transcription factor is expressed in. Uh, that's the transfer link. Mm -hmm. Let's have a short look at superclass uh, two, the zinc finger proteins. We have here the class of the nuclear receptors and here the big group of cysteine, histidine, zinc finger factors. Here we have one family with more than three adjacent zinc finger factors. Those that have exactly three zinc finger uh, cripple-like factors like SP1, they are very well characterized. Three zinc fingers and each of these zinc fingers recognize a triplet of nucleotides in the binding site. It is more complex with those that have a larger array of zinc fingers because not all of them are DNA binding. Some of them are for protein-protein interactions and others for RNA interactions. And sometimes they are not just aligned linearly, they may form more complex structures. Uh, and how to identify uh, subfamilies, subgroups here, that was quite an uh, effort to uh, uh, group the zinc fingers, make group-wise alignments and see how they uh, op optimally align and to identify which really are similar and belong to one subgroup. Uh, you might think that the zinc fingers are nice modules and if there are different uh, exons in the gene for such a zinc finger module, you might think that each of these or group of these modules may be uh, then encoded by one exon. Actually, when we compare several of these uh, zinc fingers, <clears throat> usually the shuffling is not of individual mo modules, but usually about after one third of such a zinc finger motif, there is a break. One third is uh, two thirds of uh, that guy are excised and the one third of the next one is missing. So it is not just that individual modules may be uh, excised by a recombination event when one zinc finger protein uh, may have given rise to, to another one during evolution. So these are the substructures of superclasses three. I go through them a little bit faster. Because I would like to uh, come up with some more conclusive uh, things. For instance, um, here is the total number of human TF genes that we have uh, identified and we were able to put into our classification, 1,575. Well, it's quite a number. And when you think of say 30,000 genes or whatever, uh, we can already form quite a number of combinations of out of these 1,500 different, uh, <coughs> different transcription factors. Uh, when you just consider uh, say five different transcription factors acting on one promoter, then you could already come up with a number of one times 10 to the 16th of different combinations that you can build out of these uh, uh, genes. But there is another source of variability and this is extremely extended splice variability. For instance, for this factor, CREM. 
cyclic AMP regulatory element modulator. 19 different splice variants and some of them affect actually the dimerization domain or the DNA binding domain or the transactivating domain. So this is another source of extreme transcription factor variability and nature makes use of that. So altogether we have an average of only 1.75 gene products per gene across all the human TF genes, but some of them are subject as we have seen to much more extended splice variants. And there is another variability source <clears throat> and this is the heterodimerization <clears throat> that we were already uh, addressing. Especially say the BZIP proteins, the class of BZIP proteins, here we have 47 genes encoding such proteins giving rise to uh, uh, 248 known and proven uh, dimers, heterodimers, uh, and altogether an average molecular number of ever molecular dimers per genus of 13. Also the BHLH proteins <clears throat> form an extended number of uh, dimers, about 8.5 possible molecular dimers per genus. The nuclear receptors of C4, zinc finger type, uh, are subject to extensive dimerization and even a small, relatively small family of the E2F regulators, regulators of cell cycle, do an extensive uh, dimerization uh, and this guy as well. So there's a combinatorial explosion when we include all this kind of uh, hetero uh, dimerization possibilities. <clears throat> At the end, <clears throat> I wanted to show you a few insights that uh, teach us something about the evolution of transcription factors and the DNA binding. Um, we have mentioned already that the helix turn helix DNA binding motif is a very old one. You find it in bacteria already. Uh, it is an evolutionarily very old one and very robust one, and you find it even in the human genome. It is a very stable one, very robust one. And uh, maybe it's not that astonishing that it has the lowest splice variability of all these uh, groups. So that just to remind you that the helix to helix motif was already found as the prokaryotic DNA binding domain paradigm. The largest group of transcription factors in the human genome, the superclass two, all the zinc finger proteins, is the most variable group due to rearrangement of its DNA binding modules. There are individual modules, no, as I said before, not individual modules, but half modules that are cut out and the re uh, remaining ones are uh, ligated again, uh, giving rise to an extremely variable set of transcription factors. And actually, these are, in contrast to the homeodomain factors, for instance, in superclass three, they are extremely well conserved, even from Drosophila to human. <coughs> but the zinc figures are extremely variable amongst different species, and they are subject to intensive evolution uh, until today. A recent article called it Zinc Finger Domains in Metazones Evolution Gone Wild, and that's really so. Even amongst primates, you find specific zinc finger uh, transcription factors that differ. You don't find any homeodomain or helix to helix proteins that differ between other primates and the human. But zinc fingers, you do. And even when you compare the superclass distribution amongst human genera and mouse genera uh, that we have uh, also classified, however, we identified them as homologues of humans. So only mouse transcription factors that are oscillogs to human transcription factors were included in our mouse catalog. And therefore you see that the percentage of zinc finger proteins is way smaller, 39% only, than we have in human. If we would go in the next step 
to identify all the most specific transcription factors of zinc phenotype, I'm sure this will blow up again to the 50% uh, quote that we have here. And another interesting observation we made that superclass one, for instance, in fishes has been split into two, two different clusters. Actually, that was not that much of a surprise because it is already well known that parts of fish genomes have been subject to duplication during evolution. And especially the transcription factors of superclass one were affected by that. And uh, when you look at the phylogenetic tree of all the vertebrates that we uh, had the sequences of, then you see here, here is the group of C. Jun, here of Jun D, and here of Jun B proteins. And within C. Jun, we have lots of fish C. Juns right here. You can't see it, you have to believe me. And there is a second cluster of C. Jun I call it a Sijun 2 of fishes here. It's a bit more distantly related to the mammalian Sijuns that we have here. Same for Jundi. Here we have the mammalian group, the fish group, and the second fish group is here. Whereas for Jun B, we have one, we have also two groups, but they are nearly <coughs> equidistant to the mammalian. Jun B sequences concluded here. So there is a lot of evolutionary aspects that you can uh, play with. And even when you have a look at the logo plots, you can again identify discriminating positions, even between the second C Jun and Jun D cluster and all the others, which uh, may give rise to the assumption <coughs> that uh, evolution made use of the gene duplication to create C. Jun and Jun D with slightly different DNA binding and dimerization specificities to be proven. And this is what I meant with finding functional correlates. And uh, of course, this work is going on, especially in my former department at the Göttingen University. And there, Jürgen Dönitz, together with uh, two students, uh, did, for instance, the following. They made use of all our DNA binding domain uh, alignments and the logo plots that we created, created uh, HMMs, hidden Markov models, and used them to categorize new, uh, newly identified tr transcription factors in a couple of other genomes to expand our classification to then a way larger group of, uh, of um, uh, genomes than we could do so far. So I'm nearly at the end. The available sites where you can go to is first of all, uh, my personal homepage. Uh, it uh, looks like that. There's a classification scheme as a plain HTML document for human and mouse transcription factors. It is the most up-to-date. I play around with that, but sometimes it is somewhat experimental. But the main page, the authoritative page for TF class, you find at the university homepage. This is, it is this one. Here you have the comprehensive website with tri transcription factors of all mammalian species including uh, extended uh, libraries of phylogenetic trees on different levels, classes, families, subfamilies, and numerous database cross-links, more than I have shown you before. This is the most elaborate and richest resource for TF class. But interesting also, at, on the side of our company, GeneXplain, there is a site where you can have the complete catalog uh, separately at the different levels superclass, class, family, subfamily, or all species level. Uh, and there is are free uh, uh, links to the TransFAC uh, database, uh, to the TransFAC factor entries without any authorization. Here you don't need a license to go to this part of the TransFAC database. There are a few references that uh, you uh, may be interested in. Uh, uh, here's a a mistake that should be uh, 18, I think, 2018. 
And I have to give credit mainly to Jürgen Dönitz and Thorsten Schepps, my uh, two colleagues at Göttingen University, uh, that helped me with all the arrangements, with setting up the website, with making all the scripts that were needed to uh, uh, compare and align all these uh, uh, and retrieve the sequences. And to my colleagues, Jeanette Koschmann, Matthias Krull and Philipp Stegmeier for certain aspects of the TF class on side of uh, the company, which I didn't have the time to go into the details, especially Philip made very interesting uh, research on the uh, correlation between TF class and their binding sites, whether they correlate in the classification. And very, my very final slide is the one with which I uh, would like to announce the next uh, um, webinar to the subject that will be dedicated to the Transfac database, which I cut short today, uh, which is the database about eukaryotic transcription factors, genomic binding sites, DNA binding profiles, the latest state of that, what to do, how to make use of Transfac for recognition of uh, 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 transcription factor binding site in the genome. And you will uh, be, you are invited to join us at that uh, occasion again, and you will get invitations to that shortly. With that, I would like to finish my talk and hand over to Olga, who agreed to uh, guide us through the question session. <clears throat> yeah, Professor Wengender, thank you so much, really, for your great presentation. We learn a lot about structure of transcription factors. Thank you very much. And we did get uh, several thanks for people as well. Uh, and we get several very interesting questions. Uh, right. There is a question about pioneering transcription factors that modulate chromatin landscape. And uh, please share your ideas about classification of these factors. Oh, yeah, that's a very good question. <clears throat> um, I think especially the, the FOX factors as a subgroup uh, of the helix turn helix factors uh, are best characterized as pioneering factors. And I'm personally convinced really that there are such pioneering factors, at least for a certain uh, group of target genes and target promoters. Um, of course, uh, all these histo modifications have to be done, but uh, why, when, under what conditions? There must be an original signal that is laid down in the sequence, right? There should be a transcription factor. First of all, flag an enhancer, flag a promoter. Here is a regulatory sequence which should be modified now by proper acetylation of the histones or whatever. And this is really what, uh, what the role of such a pioneering factor should be. There might be other classes of promoters where a set of transcription factors has to act from the very beginning in a coordinate way, uh, maybe. But the concept of pioneering factors is something that we also have extensively studied from the bioinformatic point of view, together with my colleague Martin Halborg at the University in Göttingen, and made use of that. And there is a paper about this also. Uh, but indeed, it is a very good and, in my view, valid concept. Thank you. Uh, the next question would be about uh, Tata Les promoters. Mm -hmm. and what kind of proteins stabilize transcription initiation complex at the promoter sites or initiation sites that do not contain data molecule? Um, yeah, I, to my knowledge, uh, it is mainly then uh, valid for housekeeping genes that have a, frequently a cluster of CG-rich elements addressed by certain zinc finger proteins like the SP1. Uh, uh, transcription factor, which then through some acidic or glutamine rich uh, region um, enhances the uh, formation of the pre-initiation complex, including through protein-protein interactions, the TUFs, including the TBP, which as I mentioned, will be part of this pre-initiation complex as well, even if it does not recognize the Tata uh, element. But I think, uh, uh, it will contact the DNA then at that place where it has been forced to sit down. But the main point here, I think, are clusters uh, of um, other uh, 
uh, uh, protein binding sites, especially uh, SP1 sites with their CG rich elements. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, is there biological classification of transcription factors into metabolism regulated TFs, cell cycle regulating TFs? And so maybe you would like to share your <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, also a very good point that we have internally discussed a lot. And of course, one possibility to uh, classify them in such a way would simply to make use of gene ontology, right? They are all assigned uh, to gene ontology categories. Uh, and there you could uh, uh, make a very nice functional classification with regard to biological processes uh, that, that would be my recommendation. There is another way uh, of the of classification that we have applied earlier, and yeah, just uh, Olga, you made a lot of uh, <laughs> work in that direction. For instance, to differentiate between those transcription factors that are involved in housekeeping regulation and those that are uh, re involved in signal response to external signals or that are primarily involved in uh, tissue specific or developmental control and so on and so on. Uh, and there are interesting findings that uh, sometimes they are combined through certain elements, composite elements in the promoter. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, indeed, that would be an interesting task for the future to come up with a more comprehensive classification with this kind of role in the, in the uh, transcription control. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So another question. What do you think about alternative TF classification according to their binding sites, to their cis binding elements? Mm -hmm. Can be done. And in many cases, you will come up with something very, very similar as what we have done. Um, and this is uh, also subject of the work of Philipp Stegmaier, which I very briefly have uh, uh, mentioned at, near the end of my talk. Um, he could show that uh, this kind of classification really confirms to a large extent the uh, class, family, subfamily structure that, that we have in the classification. There are certainly exceptions <clears throat> where certain zinc fingers and uh, I, I love this group, really. <laughs> These zinc fingers are so uh, amazing. They can adapt DNA binding specificity to nearly any other sequence uh, and uh, can mimic this way the binding of other factors, probably by uh, maybe by excluding them from their original binding site or whatever. Did I mention that I hate them? Uh, <laughs> so it's really confusing what they can, can do. Um, yeah, but as I said, uh, in those cases that we have uh, analyzed extensively, uh, you come up with something very similar. Thank you. Next question. Would it be possible to predict the nature of regulation, gene activation or gene deactivation, based on the sequence and structure of TFs and their DNA motifs they bind to? Mm, that's a good and complex question. Um, I could make it simple, say no. <laughs> <laughs> but that would also not be correct. Well, if, if a protein, a newly discovered protein, would have a classical transrepression domain, say a polyalanine stretch, then you might guess this is a transrepressor. And wherever this protein binds to, it exerts a repressing uh, event. However, uh, by time we have learned that nearly all transcription factors <clears throat> can have a activating as well as a repressing function that probably depends very much on the position where their binding site is placed and whether they can cooperate with other transcription factors in a constructive way, in an activating way, or whether they are going to prevent other transcription factors from becoming active. 
it is well known that for uh, certain nuclear receptors, nucle uh, I think glucocorticoid receptors, there are maybe even different DNA binding motifs for repressing and activating elements. But uh, I think this is an exception where uh, the same factor binds to activating and repressing sequence elements. Um, in most other cases, the factor just binds somewhere and exerts then the one or the other effect depending on the context. And this context is really very hard to predict in terms of function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, there, there is one question uh, about role of uh, helix turn helix transcription factors in oncogenesis. Could you comment something on this? Uh, yeah, good question. I'm. This helix turn helix, they are very much involved in development, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And therefore, it might be plausible to assume that uh, processes connected with de-differentiation and re-differentiation or whatever uh, might be connected to those proteins. But uh, I don't remember um, an example for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that there are others like, again, zinc finger, is that zinc fingers are involved, but uh, helix turn helix, uh, not the homeo domain proteins to my knowledge, but maybe some of the Fox proteins, which uh, we have already discussed as potential um, pioneering factors. Maybe, maybe, maybe some of them can, uh, are involved in, in that end, of course, yeah, um, the MIB factors, CMIB, M-Y-B, they, they, of course, these are also pro proto-oncogenes that uh, are then uh, maybe involved in, in certain tumor developments. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, the, some are there, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, maybe Interesting question, what type of sequencing data was used to identify DBD of transcription factors? This protein sequencing or how they identified? <laughs> well, yeah, in the beginning it was uh, certainly, <clears throat> historically speaking, in the 80s, it was classical protein purification, then uh, protein sequencing, then constructing primers and trying to fish a cDNA clone that encodes that protein. <clears throat> but uh, later on, and the huge amount of transcription factors we know today, that's uh, all coming from, from sequence analysis, from <clears throat> and then uh, uh, first bioinformatic analysis, of course, and then, then uh, uh, experimental analysis by uh, studying what is the function of, of the protein, which is the DNA binding protein domain, uh, what can I cut out, what can I truncate uh, to maintain or to, to destroy the one or the other activity and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think with this we can finalize our web seminar for today. Thank you very much everyone for your active participation and for your questions. Okay, thank you very much from my side too. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.